Kia ora tato. I feel like saying welcome again to our lunchtime webinar because I feel quite sure that many of you joining us join us regularly. Welcome again. Presenter today is Kate Berridge and Kate is founder and director of Beyond Obesity. She's passionate about reframing the way obesity is viewed in our current environment, in particular how it intersects with health and health care. Her study around obesity has shown the impact shame has on our physical and mental health. The provision of self-care is not intuitive. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora. Uh, so shall I just get started? Yep. Okay. So today's presentation is why diets don't work. Um, and I shall just kick right off and start with my first slide. Uh, so what you can see in front of you is a series of Russian dolls. And uh, many of us have quite a, quite a clear and fixed view about weight loss, weight gain, how we feel about ourselves related to our weight. Uh, and we have a very dominant narrative that tells us that uh, skinny is good and fat is bad. However, this is not a scenario that is as simple as it appears. And it's certainly not a one size fits all scenario. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. And I would like to just give up some really useful, easy read uh, references. And there's one that I've left off that I wanted to put on. Um, and maybe you can write this down or you'll get some handouts, but I'll just go through some of these people so that we can understand that this is just not the world according to Kate. There's a whole lot of research uh, and a whole lot of other people working in this area. And I've already seen a spelling mistake. So that's a great start. Um, <laughs> so the top one we have is Robin Tumath. Now Robin Tumath uh, may be familiar to many of you and she set up um, a wonderful uh, sort of social movement around how actually dieting uh, is particularly bad for people's health and unfortunately for us Robin uh, hung up her hat probably about four or five years ago I was deeply devastated because a lot of her work was truly formative and very very useful she's still got some very useful work and she is uh, a New Zealander and she writes from the New Zealand perspective um, the second one is a gentleman from Australia he's an obesity specialist he also writes a lot about what I'm going to talk about, weight cycling, the physiology uh, related to weight loss and weight gain. Uh, the third one is an American, and his name is not actually spelled K -E with an E-N, it's an I-N. Uh, his name is Kevin Hall, and a lot of his work is hugely remarkable. He's very accessible. You just need to Google him. He has lots of uh, free webinars, but it's a lot of incredible uh, scientific data which is truly groundbreaking really. Uh, the next one we have is Ira Sharma. Ira Sharma originally was a, a kidney specialist but is now essentially an obesity specialist and he set up a, uh, a whole structure in Canada called uh, Canada Obesity Canada and if anybody wants to look up really useful user-friendly information about this topic. Uh, Obesity Canada is an excellent uh, website. It has stuff for healthcare professionals. It has stuff for clients, for patients. It's really useful. And in all honesty, the Can Canadians are a long way ahead of us uh, in this field. The next one I'm talking about is Yoni Friedhoff. He is also an obesity specialist. He is also Canadian uh, and he's written a very good book called Why Diets Don't Work uh, and he is also part of that whole Canadian surge forward. The next one is Rebecca Pearl. She has been working around stigma, weight bias and prejudice for a very long time and has some fundamentally stunning work. Uh, the next gentleman is Christopher Gardner. Now he talks a lot more about food, diets, uh, he's done a lot of very interesting research out of Berkeley and uh, the, the impact around food and the physiology. The last one is Marion Nessel, and she's a dietitian with a PhD and amazing. She has just done a lot of incredible work. Um, and the one that I've realized I've forgotten is a gentleman called Giles Yeo, and he is an obesity geneticist. geneticist. Uh, and he comes from England. He's got a wonderful book called Gene Eating. Um, and nicely or, or interestingly, he uh, 
he waded into our little debate that we had several week be weeks back with uh, Judith Collins and her comment about obesity, which I am going to do some work on today. Okay, so hopefully that's some homework for people to go and have a look at if they're interested. Um, so where to start? So I've talked about that I will discuss the physiology and the psychology related to uh, what we call weight cycling. And a lot of people will think of yo-yo dieting as weight cycling. They're kind of two things and they're a little bit separate, but they're kind of the same. So if I had a dollar for every patient in the last 14 years who was said to me at my initial assessment, I can lose weight, I just can't keep it off. And that is literally word for word. And I do not know how many times I've heard that. And I used to say, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said that, I'd have a wonderful fund for traveling. Not going to be doing so much traveling just at the moment. So I just have a nice little nest egg. But in reality, this, this concept about losing weight is part of the dominant narrative that we assume that we can lose weight. And once we lose weight, then it's just going to magically stay off forever and a day. Uh, that is not the case, which is what we're going to talk about today. So my tagline, if anybody wants to look at me at Twitter or anyone wants to go on to me in LinkedIn, is that obesity is not the choice it's assumed to be. And this is the heart of the problem, is we've been sold a story that the worst thing we could possibly be is perhaps to be fat. So much of my work is listening to what has happened to people as they were growing up, as they were working to fit into life uh, and have ended up struggling significantly with their weight. And again, if I had a dollar for every story I have heard of anywhere from six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, where young women, predominantly women, um, have been put on diets because their parents are really concerned that their child is not going to fit in. And underlying all of this is what a lot of the wellness researchers are now understanding is that many of us as healthcare professionals think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I do too, and I think it's very important. It's a little bit Eurocentric, but we all understand that food, oxygen, those sorts of things come before physiological and psychological safety. And then we think about love and belonging and self-worth and connection. However, what is coming out in the research currently is that love and belonging is fundamentally important to being able to get food, shelter and oxygen. What we now understand about prolactin, oxytocin, how the brain works, the neurology associated with connection, we are starting to see some really interesting stuff in the research. So what I see when people are in bigger bodies is that there is an absolute disconnect because the body is what is stopping love and connection. So when we have young children, as young as six, seven, eight, having parents tell them that you're too big, your body does not fit, this actually tells a child that they are not enough, that they are not seen. This creates significant psychological impacts further down the line. I currently work with people who have had weight loss surgery, who are considering weight loss surgery, who are not considering weight loss surgery, who would just like to lose weight, keep weight off. I work with a whole range of people who are struggling with the body that they have. Now, in reality, Everyone's body is fit for purpose. What no one can see when they see me sitting here in my little cupboard um, is that I've actually got curly hair and that I'm six foot tall. And both things are who I am. They're a huge amount of who I am. But in the environment that we live in, we are always kind of trying to choose and shift our body so that it's not actually fit for purpose for what my body is fit for purpose, but for something that this system, our structures, our hierarchies, our patriarchies, all of these things that create how we fit in, how we are seen, how we are accepted, how we can be worthy in love and belonging. So living with a bigger body in 2020 
brings with it psychological issues that if you don't have that kind of body, you actually don't understand. So this big disconnect around needing to lose weight because it's about health um, is actually creating both physiological and psychological harm. So it's, it's and it's, what I'm gonna discuss with you is it's not the choice that we think it is. Many of us are walking around with belief systems that you know what, if you just stop eating it, that's going to solve the problem. Hopefully, by the time we get to the end of today, you're going to discover that it's not just about the food, that it is incredibly complex. So I'm not sure because I'm just sitting here looking at a screen, but I'm hoping that everybody who's looking at this actually has an understanding of who this guy is. But if you don't have an understanding of who this guy is, I'm going to explain him to you. He's from a computer game and his name is Ghosty. And Ghosty comes out, and there's quite a few of them, and they come out on the computer screen and they go like this, they go rip, 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 across the screen. And the, 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 game, the game is to get these other guys that come along and they go rip, 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 rip. So this little picture here is my metaphor for cortisol, my metaphor for the distress that we all get to live with, the impact of fight, flight, or freeze, or the impact of opening up your emails and discover you've got 30 emails and you have to deal with them all today, out comes your cortisol, you can feel it, you can feel the stress, your breathing changes. This guy here is fundamental to our weight. Now, in my clinical experience, and just to give you all a little bit of a background, uh, in 2007, Counties Manukau DHB set up, um, through the Clark government, they set up uh, publicly funded bariatric surgery. So I was the first bariatric nurse specialist. And I have to say, I went into this job hugely naive. I went in with what I now understand is a whole lot of thin privilege. I'm six foot tall. At the time, I had just finished doing an Ironman. I was ridiculously fit. I weighed 73 kgs, and I just had a whole lot of stuff going down that was totally um, not in tune with the people that I was working with. And it took me about three years to really get my head around the fact that there was something going on that I didn't know what it was. And it really was, you know, hand on heart. I, I think about what Maya Angelou says is to forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know. And I think about those three years straight after Iron Man, working with people who were struggling significantly, both with their weight, with their mental health, a whole lot of stuff, and having to work with me. I'm, I'm really sorry, it probably wasn't the greatest thing. But it was a huge learning. Because what I could see is that we set up a program, and that program still exists, and I'm not really comfortable about it, but it is what it is. Because it was a publicly funded program, and because there is so much bias and prejudice, both implicit and explicit around people in bigger bodies, what I like to call the ZBs in the early days were like, you know, this is my taxpayer funded money, spending money on people who just eat meat pies and they're not doing a very good job. So we needed to put some clear boundaries so that we had achievable outcomes and why we had achievable outcomes. But what these achievable outcomes did worked very well for the DHB, worked very well for the healthcare professionals, really isn't working very well for patients. And what I saw was that we would counsel, coach, work alongside people with getting people to change their diet, change their lifestyle, get some exercise in, really make sure that they were making healthy food choices, and we would invariably see the weight come off and we would invariably see the weight come back on again. So what was happening here is what I call life happening. And it's this dude here, it's cortisol. When life happens, it's very difficult for a whole raft of reasons to stay motivated to eating uh, mung beans, tofu, shakes, whatever you want to be doing, whether you're just taking uh, salads and protein or what, whatever particular specific diet you have gone on, it's all very well when everything's going tickety-boo. But when stuff happens, life happens, things shift and change. And I'm sure everybody in this uh, 
webinar is aware of what we're calling the COVID kilos. You know, literally, I, my business has gone gangbusters because of the amount of regain weight loss surgery patients have had post COVID, which really just confirms the impact of living with distress, life happening, things happening. If you have some of the uh, issues that I'm going to go over in a while related to stress. So in reality, my friend cortisol and distress have a huge amount to do with weight gain and also trying to lose weight because there's the stress associated with not fitting into the structure and then there's the stress associated with actually gaining weight and feeling like you're the only one that can't do this. So my understanding of weight cycling and weight cycling is basically that thing that I could have lots of money from is that I can lose weight, but I just can't keep it off. So pretty much anyone who has ever attempted to lose weight has the experience of in the short term losing weight and then there is the experience of gaining weight. Now, what happens when we gain weight? We don't just gain weight to where we were, we gain weight slightly higher. And for the first sort of three to five years working at Counties Manukau, I was aware that it was related to stress. I learned to do CBT. I now understand ACT, which is called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, which is a far better uh, fit than cognitive behavioral therapy for people who are in this situation. Um, but I was very aware of weight cycling. And I was very aware that when we put targets in place for people, uh, and I was talking to a client two days ago, she was 140 kgs, her knee needed replacing. She'd been to uh, the orthopedic surgeon. The orthopedic surgeon said, yep, you can have a total knee joint replacement when you get to 120 kgs. So she needed to lose 20 kgs with a sore knee, not being able to exercise particularly well. And she did it. She lost 120 kgs. When she got to this, the orthopedic surgeon, the registrar was taking over this appointment and not the orthopedic surgeon who had actually written the, the um, target. So she was like, I'm at this weight. I'm now going to be able to get my knee replacement so that I can get on with my life and I'm not going to be in so much pain. The registrar said, oh, no, I don't think that's enough. No, you need to go away and lose another 10 kgs. Now, what that target has done has meant that this woman is living a very difficult life trying to keep that weight off, really, really working hard. And then to have that goalpost moved obviously creates a significant amount of stress. She had a whole lot of stress. Her weight went back up and it went back 10 kgs heavier. She was not able to get her knee joint replacement until she went through that cycle again. So this is what I see in, in weight cycling. Call it yo-yo dieting, call it weight cycling, but it's what the human body does. So I knew it was a thing, and I knew there was something that was theorized about what's called the set point. But this slide here that says then Cuba, this particular study has changed the way that we understand about weight cycling. So many of you will know the, the, the story of Cuba in the Cuba... Um, had in the 90s had significant issues related to uh, political problems. There was um, sanctions, there was no food, there was no fuel. Life was very, very difficult for quite a period in Cuba. Now, what, us, what many of us don't understand is that the previous regime, every time somebody in Cuba went to the GP, they had every single person, every single Cuban had their HbA1c tested their height, their weight, and their waist circumference. So that's an amazing data bank of incredible information. And what the study showed is that when the sanctions happened, because food became scarce, uh, fuel became scarce, many people got on bikes, they walked, they moved, their diet had to change, they had no choice the whole population, and if we look at the forest pot, plot of the whole population, we had people at the top end, we had people at the bottom end, and people all over the space within their weight. When the sanctions happened, the entire population lost weight. So there wasn't food and they were exercising. However, as the sanctions changed and more food came in and things shifted, 
the entire population, as they'd lost weight, they all gained weight and they all gained weight back plus more to where they were before the sanctions came in. Now, there's a whole lot of really interesting stuff in around uh, some of the cardiac stuff and around the HbA1c. And, and feel free to go and have a read of that because it's incredibly interesting. But what it meant is it's changed how we understand weight cycling. So when we get people to lose weight and take pictures of themselves standing in their jeans going, woohoo, look at me, I've lost all this weight. We are attributing eating disorders or disordered eating and telling people that they're doing incredibly well. And then when we understand that the physiology associated with this means that their body is always going to go back up to that weight, this is where we are aiding and abetting poorer physical and mental health. Because what happens, uh, and I mentioned Kevin Hall before, Kevin Hall uh, looked at the TV program, The Biggest Loser. I have to tell you, The Biggest Loser is, it, it hurts my heart. It's truly awful stuff. But he took season, gosh, I can never remember if it was season six or season eight, one of those seasons. He took the whole season and he monitored uh, basal metabolic rates. He looked at what happens to basal metabolic rates. And as people in The Biggest Loser, the whole season, lost their weight through ridiculous amounts of exercise and, you know, serious diet restriction. Yep, there was incredible weight loss. But what he, said, what he saw through his study was that almost all of them regained their weight. Those who didn't had weight loss surgery to ensure that the weight stayed off. But what was the most surprising thing that Kevin Hall found, and this was in 2014, was that once you drop your basal metabolic rate from doing significant weight loss, your basal metabolic rate stays down at that level. Your body or your brain, your set point says, hang on, this is not compatible with life. If you're not going to give me enough food, then I'm just going to sit down here. So what happens is your metabolic rate means that you can survive on 800 calories a day, 1200 calories a day. But when you try to go back to a different lifestyle, or as my, my slide previously showed, life happens, or I want to say shit happens, um, and you unfortunately eat more than you're supposed to, you drink more than you're supposed to, you are just going to put that weight back on again. And that means that you have a lowered basal metabolic rate and you are actually struggling all of the time to go back. So this is why we see people lose weight and gain weight. It's physiological, but it's also psychological. So with all of that, understanding all of that, um, there is a whole, was a whole lot, there's a whole lot of work in around, you know, if you eat this particular way, if you don't eat this, if you don't eat that. And many, many companies do very, very well out of selling diets. Uh, you know, we went through a craze of a beta HCD, HCG diet, which was essentially 800 calories a day. So of course people were losing weight because their restriction meant that they were losing weight. Uh, but they would bounce back up again. So there's this, there's this hope where we're going to have one particular diet that's going to solve all of this problem. In reality, it's way more complex than this. So in 2018, I went to what's called Obesity Week, and there was, and Kevin Hall, my hero, it was very exciting, uh, he moderated a session between uh, two guys who had done a lot of really, really interesting uh, food-based diets. And some of them were in uh, environments where the people were actually not able to what they call free eat. So they had a prescribed meal and they weren't actually out in the community. They were actually in um, hospital or in uh, accommodation and they were for periods of time, they were only given certain foods. So from a micro uh, unit, we could actually see what was happening on the, on the body associated with certain kinds of foods. And there's certainly a lot of differences that happen to um, our lipids, all those sorts of things. But these people were essentially like caged animals. And as soon as they were able to, as they delightfully called this, free eat, literally 100% of those people went back to their previous weights. So when we have a prescribed kind of diet that is not 
that is not enjoyable, that feels depriving, that will create people to go and do things that they perhaps wouldn't do if they were actually enjoying what they were eating regularly. So this particular symposium was huge because what it showed, uh, and uh, one of the people, one of the talkers, uh, one of the talkers, one of the speakers, um, Christopher Gardner, actually with his multi-million dollar study showed that hmm, not one diet fits everybody. So some people, and we're starting to see this in the gene studies, some people tolerate carbs, some people don't. We have a whole range of what works for some people and what doesn't work for others. So when we as healthcare professionals suggest, well, look, this is what's working for me, you've got to try this, that might not actually work for that particular individual. So we need to be far more discerning around what works for individuals because it's not a one size fits all. So that my suspicions around that were confirmed in 2018. So in reality, what we have is a perfect storm and it's a perfect storm of complexity. Now this is a thousand piece jigsaw we should probably have a 100,000 piece jigsaw when it comes to obesity. It is incredibly complex. It is a biological, environmental, and societal and psychological process. So we have to be very, very careful as to which hill we put our this is going to work kind of hat on. So we can have um, what, I, what I tend to call the uh, religion of foodology um, and we have a whole lot of hills we have uh, keto we have whole food we have uh, whole food 360 we have vegetarianism we've got a whole lot of people who are claiming that you know 100 percent uh, protein and carnivore is the way to go and we're all on these different hills saying this one works this one works so there's that particular part of the process but then there's all of these other issues around complexity. And I'm going to go through the slide and explain how each of these impacts individuals and their weight. So many people will say to me, well, it's obviously it's about socioeconomic status. And yes, I've worked in counties Manukau. I've been in areas where there is incredible food scarcity. There is also other issues associated to that. And if anything, socioeconomic status uh, means that if you're in a higher paying job, you have greater education, you are more likely to be able to stay in a smaller body than if you are in a poorer environment. But it's not about uh, not having enough money per se. It's also about if you go to, uh, for those of you who may or may not know Auckland, I'm just going to use two suburbs. If you have uh, Glen Innes, which is an area that's in the past had significant state housing. You go up the hill and you go up to um, St. Helier's and it's up on a hill, looks down on the water. Um, if you look at the difference between these areas, and I did one day, I was riding my bike through Glen Innes at six o'clock in the morning. The amount of uh, fast food outlets per kilometer is huge. You come up the hill to a much nicer area and there you have, uh, delis, you don't actually have too many McDonald's, you have lots of things that are selling whole food, salmon, nuts, all sorts of things, but the cost is reasonably prohibitive. So socioeconomic status has an impact in that sort of state, but as far as across the board, I work both publicly and privately, I work with people from across every sector, and I can tell you the people who are having privately funded weight loss surgery have, have the finance to do it, but they are equally affected by obesity as those who are in lower socioeconomic groups. So yes, it's, it's an impact, it, it's a part of the picture, but it's not the whole picture. Then we have genes. Now, at this stage, there is a suggestion that there may be up to 600 different genes associated with weight gain. So these genes are essentially what loads the gun. So if you come from a family, I come from a family of my father was six foot six, I'm six foot, hello, well that's 182 centimeters. Um, there's a reason I'm 182 centimeters, these are my genes. Can I do anything about it? I tried, actually, no, can't do anything about it. So there are specific genes that we know that mean that people will, if they sniff a donut, they're gonna put on weight. Other people, they can have three donuts, two meat pies, and they don't put on weight. 
And these are frequently the people that say to the people who can sniff the donut, well, just don't eat it because that's not their lived experience. And when I first started as a bariatric nurse specialist, I, I confess, I scoffed genes. Oh, it's got nothing to do with the genes. Has a lot to do with our genes. And then we have our epigenetics and that's where Giles Yeo is very useful around the genes. Um, epigenetics, I'm not sure if people fully understand what epigenetics are, but what we know within obesity is that what happens in utero has a huge impact on whether you're going to put weight on or not. And what we also know is that if there is epigenetic changes in utero, that then gets passed on to every subsequent um, gene pool from that particular person. And there's a very interesting study that was done out of Amsterdam with that. So if, for example, you have a client who, and we've seen this in weight loss surgery, who prior to weight loss surgery has a baby, then after weight loss surgery, they have a baby. Uh, the baby that is born after weight loss surgery has a greater propensity of putting on weight than the one when you hadn't had surgery because of the lowered basal metabolic rate that weight loss surgery brings about. So we have to be very, very careful in having babies post weight loss surgery to make sure that the baby is getting, or the in utero, the baby is getting enough uh, nutrients of both um, good quality food, but vitamins and minerals because weight loss surgery changes that process. So epigenetically, if you have, if you have a mother who's had serious hyperemesis with one pregnancy and not with the others, you will find that that particular child is born hungrier because of interuterine growth retardation. That hunger satiety does not go for the rest of their life. So that child is actually going to be more hungry than a child who had no issues in utero and doesn't have an increased level of hormones telling them to eat frequently. So it can be as simple as a family of three and one child had a different pregnancy. So epigenetics have a huge impact. Now, the obesogenic environment also has a massive impact. If we think back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, the diet was completely different to what we see globally now. What we know now is that 51% of the global population has a BMI of greater than 30. So what that tells you, if it was just the odd person, then it might be that we need to have willpower. But in reality, this burgeoning weight issue is coming not only from our genes and our epigenetics, but the environment that we currently live in. And this is the work that Robin Tumath was trying to do is we can say you have to say no, but there's a lot more associated with that. So the obesogenic environment, and uh, as I said uh, several weeks back, is that what we say in, in obesity is that the genes load the gun, the environment pulls the trigger. So there's that. And then there's the number of attempts at weight loss. So if you've had several attempts at weight loss, we know that your basal metabolic rate has lowered because you lost weight. And the more times you do that, all you do is you lose gain, lose gain, lose gain. And so many of my clients have, you know, when I say to them, so how many diets have you been on? <sighs> they can name hundreds of different diets um, and they all work in the short term, but long term, we end up back in the same space. So the number of diets has a big impact. Childhood trauma. Now, we, can, we know that adverse childhood events, so if you have more than four adverse childhood events in your um, growing up, your chance of addiction uh, goes up significantly. For many of my patients, there is food addiction. So they have had childhood trauma. They've been under the age of six. They've been in very difficult situations. They've been in fight, flight, or freeze. And what often happens is some kind of high fat, high food, high fat, high sugar food is consumed. And in a system that is totally got lots of cortisol, we've got adrenaline, everything's zooming around, the nervous system is in complete sympathetic, straight up the top there, give somebody some dopamine associated with high fat and high sugar, that actually lowers the levels, it's like my little friend here, along comes the dopamine, do, 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 everything feels better. You have a nervous system that then starts to remember, what did we do last time? Oh, I know, we had a trumpet. Oh, I know, we had something yummy to eat and that helped 
me feel better because it lowered my level of distress, taking me from sympathetic to parasympathetic nervous system. So childhood trauma has a lot to do with long-term weight gain. We know that if you have had more than four adverse childhood events, the number of uh, the, the, the increased chance is 36%, but that's for weight alone. And that is not even taking into consideration that food, high fat, high sugar food, is actually quite addictive. And this is how many people soothe themselves. They self-soothe. Again, if I had a dollar for every one of my clients who tell me that they're an emotional eater, and they believe that that's them that's doing it. And I'm going to explain to you later why that isn't them. So there's that. And then there's life experience. So this is the conditioning of what we've grown up with. So things like you can't have any dessert until you've eaten all of your vegetables or um, how a family loves around food. Does food mean love? This is connected to certain emotions. So our life experiences, how we experience food within that is imprinted in our neurology and has quite significant impacts. Then there's food scarcity. What we see with food scarcity, if somebody has experienced food scarcity in their formative years, that has long lasting impact. And the people who have experienced food scarcity and then have food abundance will have cupboards and cupboards full of food. Um, my mother-in-law, she is Dutch. She was, uh, through the Second, Second War years, she was um, in Amsterdam and Amsterdam was starving. She is currently, unfortunately, starting with the beginning stages of Alzheimer's. And a couple of Christmases ago, she couldn't find the Christmas presents. And so I went with my sister-in-law to go and see if we can find them in her room. Um, and she lives in a rest home. And opening every single drawer, there was all of the treats she had been given by her family, wrapped up in toilet paper, knitting, her underpants, clothes, because that food scarcity the fear she is not going to have enough food means that she is always going to squirrel away food. And she struggled with weight cycling throughout her life, partly because of that and other reasons. Um, the, this, this one here, weight bias and stigma. Now, this has a huge impact, but I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Um, and we also have intellectual or physical disability. Things like Prada Willy, there is a whole lot of stuff associated with that. Um, that means that food has a different impact. So when we just assume that you're not eating the right food, um, and so if you just go on this diet over here, that's going to solve the problem, you can start to see how this impacts people's mental health. Now, the last one that I want to talk about uh, is called internalized oppression. And I'm just going to read this for you. It's when people are targeted, discriminated against, or oppressed over a period of time. They believe and make part of their self-image their internal views of themselves, the myths and misinformation that society communicates to them about their group. And as you can see, I have a picture here of uh, what I thought was just going to be one soundbite, turned out to be a whole article, so that was a bit interesting. Um, so when Judith Collins, the week before the election, said that obesity is about personal choice, um, yeah, I was a little bit upset. So when the, re the reporter contacted me, I sort of said that I had steam coming out of my ears. Now, the reason I felt that was because, as I've just explained to you, there is personal choice in here and there is certain kinds of foods in here. But as you can see, it's far more complex. But what was more interesting to me was the second day. So the first day, you know, Judith very nicely said, well, it's not catchy because we're in the COVID environment. No, obesity is not catchy. But it is fundamentally not just about the food that people are putting in their mouth. Now, the next day, Duncan Garner was interviewing Judith. And as I was watching it, my heart broke. I felt so, so compassionate and empathetic towards Judith because what she, would, what she was doing and what she had said was actually coming from her own self-judgment about how she feels about her ability to keep the weight on and off. And so as Duncan Gardner was drilling down further into, well, why did you say that? And how does this work? I watched Judith really demonstrate to me her internalized oppression. She was struggling with 
how she has struggled with her weight. So she judges herself that she is not enough, that she can't do this. And really it's just a matter of not having those chips, of not eating that food. And if I can just say no, then that's going to solve the problem. So unfortunately, that whole process was really an example of internalized depression. And really my heart broke. And it's not useful to say, well, she, she can't say that, look, because she's in a bigger body and she can't do that because that doubles down on our internalized oppression. So what I do know from my cohort is that most people will attempt to put it out there before anybody else can. You know, make jokes about, I might break the chair or, you know, uh, try to be the jolly fat person. And what is actually happening there is deep shame, deep isolation, and ways of attempting to fit in and get love and belonging and worthiness. But our environment, our current society has a narrative that says, if you are in a bigger body, you simply don't fit and you need to be skinny. This is fundamentally psychologically damaging. So couple that with what actually happens in the brain, the neurology associated with when we are starving. So we know that we've got basal metabolic rate stuff that shifts. We know that we've got the brain is constantly from a homeostatic way, trying to make sure that everything is okay. But we have a whole other process going on as well, which is the difference between what I call head hunger and real hunger. Now, real hunger is always going to be coming from the primary brain from okay, we've done a whole lot of exercise, we need to replace the nutrients. So you have a relationship between the hormones in your stomach, in your gut and your brain. And that is playing out saying, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I need to eat. And that all works perfectly well, if you've never been on a diet. However, if we fully understand that love, belonging, worthiness, connection is fundamental to happiness, and being able to sit in our front brain, then this is where things go a little bit pear shaped So our front brain, our prefrontal cortex, is where we do all our logical thinking. It's where we come up with our great ideas. It's, you know, I'm assuming that most people sitting here listening to this talk are sitting in their front brain. You've got your executive functioning going on and everything's going really nicely. Until we have some kind of distress, drama, some kind of danger, danger, risk problem. And when we are in fight, flight or freeze, our executive functioning jumps into the middle part of our brain and our limbic system takes over. So I like to think of the brain divided into three different parts. The front brain is what I call management. The mid brain is what I call human resources. And the primary brain is what I call the workers. Now, in the case of a diet, the primary brain, I'm oh, sorry, the front brain, which is management, comes up with this brilliant KPI. It says, you know what? We don't fit in. If I lost some weight, I'd feel a whole lot better. I'd be able to go into that shop, buy those clothes. I'd be able to get my knee joint replacement. People wouldn't look at me as if I don't fit in. So you know what? It's all about the food. I just need to lose some weight. So front brain goes, yeah, it's a great idea. Let's just do, I don't know. Let's go breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Knock out all of those snacks. Get rid of any alcohol. No more sugar. Let's detox. Let's absolutely just clean eat, whatever you want to call it. Front brain says, yep, that's a great idea. Awesome. So everything's going tickety-boo you're doing very well. Every time the primary brain suggests to the front brain that it'd like something to eat, management says, no, we're on a diet. We're not eating that. We can't have that kind of food. We're not allowed to do that. So the primary brain just keeps asking and the management just says, no, that's not our KPI. Jump on the scales. Woo, I'm losing some weight. This is going really well. Everything's going tickety-boo until, oh, there's a little bit of a drama. Something happens. I don't know. We run over the cat. I don't know. We've done something really bad. A little bit of drama takes us out of our front brain, dumps us into our midbrain. Human resources takes over. Human resources does everything it needs to do over here, putting out the fire. Now, what happens is your primary brain looks and says, oh, she's not watching. Excellent. She told me there's no food. But you know what? Over there, I can see a packet of chips. Oh, crikey. So the primary brain sneaks out grabs the chips and eats them all until they are satiated, until the leptin kicks in and all the hormones are like, oh yeah, Ooh. so there's this kind of euphoric, oh, that feels really good. And what happens 
is the primary brain jumps back. And let me assure you, when this happens, it's never about broccoli and eggs. It's never about steak and spinach. It's always for something that's easy to get. It's right in front of you because there's a great big drama going. Somebody's just died. People are bringing food, whatever. There's a whole lot of easy access, high fat, high sugar food. So once the hormones are satisfied, we are actually satiated. We are hungry. Primary brain jumps back and says, oh, thank God for that. But what happens is nine times out of 10, the food that has been at hand has had high fat and high sugar. So you've got yourself a bit of dopamine. That dopamine has helped the limbic system. The limbic system goes, oh, oh gosh, that's better. I'm dealing with this problem a whole lot better. Or we can just calm the farm. The moment we calm the farm, out hops the front brain, turns around, looks around and says, excuse me, what the hell did you just do? We're on a diet. Oh my God, we are never having that food again, taking it out of the house. We're never ever happening it. So what then happens is human resources starts to understand that if we actually have a trumpet or some chips or some kind of high fat, high sugary kind of food, it actually helps us deal with the distress. So what happens is you have unconscious eating of food when you feel distress. This allows the limbic system to be you know, down-regulated, so many of my clients associate decreasing stress with food and it's unconscious. It is not a conscious decision. So that midbrain is subconsciously danger, danger, danger. What did we do last time? We had some food and the midbrain has it. So this is when people will say to you, I, I just don't know what happened. What actually happened is that their brain was doing the job to take them down into parasympathetic nervous system to calm the farm for everything to settle. So on one hand, we want people to fit in and they have to have willpower and personal responsibility. And on the other hand, we have a subconscious brain keeping this person safe. So this is why it's not just about personal responsibility. And just to top things off, uh, Rebecca Poole and Yoni Friedhoff have shown that 85% of healthcare professionals have a explicit bias against people in bigger bodies. That's not even taking in the implicit bias. And I know I did a test. Um, I was a keynote speaker at a talk and I was talking about implicit and explicit bias. And I did a test about my implicit bias associated with people in bigger bodies. I've been doing this job for 14 years. I'm advocating how this works, I still have a mild implicit bias. So if it's my job and what I work on 24 seven, and I've still got a mild implicit bias, what does that say about people who haven't even thought about this? So the explicit and the implicit bias around weight being a factor that somebody is not enough, that somebody does not fit in, that somebody is X, Y, and Z. And if we as healthcare professionals are carrying this around with unpacking it, it actually has disastrous effects on our patients. So essentially, eat less and move more is the same as suggesting to a drowning person that they just swim harder. And one of the things that I would like to really reiterate that if somebody is in a bigger body and you suggest that, mm, I think the problem here is that we need to lose weight. Just wonder if, do you think that person's figured that out themselves? Do you think they didn't know that they were in a bigger body? So we don't want to be telling people to suck eggs because what I know is that 100% of the clients that I work with have attempted to lose weight more than once. And the more often they attempt to lose weight, the more we end up in this situation. So it's not just about the food. It is significantly more complex and there is a lot of shame and a lot of isolating that goes on when people are judged about what they're eating. Now I have a story of a, of a client who had two small children. It was before she had weight loss surgery. She'd been on a diet for six months. She was tired, exhausted. She got her children an ice cream. She thought, oh bugger it, I'm going to have one. She was sitting down on a park bench with her children having her ice cream and a stranger came along, took the ice cream out of her hand, threw it in the bin and said, people like you shouldn't eat that food. This is not okay. We cannot continue to assume that it's about personal choice and that that person has the ability to just step away from certain foods and change this. So 
This is why I say diets don't work. So just briefly, I want to give you something more than what not to do. Um, we need to have therapeutic relationships with our clients. And therapeutic relationships are not me telling somebody what to do. They are that I walk alongside, that I support, that I see somebody. And these therapeutic relationships require an understanding of our own bias, both our implicit and explicit. We also need to have an understanding of what external conditioning about skinny is good, fat is bad, what message that sends to people. And that we're not based on fixing. If you just lose some weight, that's gonna solve your problem. There are countless stories of people who have cancers and all sorts of issues that are not being seen because we just keep saying, well, when you've lost 20 kgs, we'll look at that. When you've lost 10 kgs, I'll refer you to. We actually need to see the whole person. We need to provide empowerment for our patients. We need to walk alongside them rather than shaming them into eat less and move more because it's not helping. It's really not helping. Now, compassion versus empathy. Compassion is a primal requirement. It says, and it comes from our primary brain. Empathy is a front brain issue. Compassion sits in our primal brain. And it says, I see you. I see you is a very powerful self-healing modality and it is reciprocal. So when I'm a healthcare professional and all I see is somebody who's 180 kgs and how the hell am I gonna look after you until you've lost 40 kgs, that doesn't see the patient. All that sees is the weight. Empathy feels others' pain. It's required for a collaborative relationship. It's, it gets lost in the power dynamics. So as healthcare professionals, compassion and empathy are our tools. So when we see our patients and we don't judge them, our patients start to flourish. So what I wanna say is assess, assess, and assess some more. So assess, what kind of trauma did you have as a child? Where do you think this is might has come from? How many diets have you been on? Ask, where do you feel you are in this process? Because let me tell you, my clients know way more about weight loss than you if you've never attempted it. So motivational interviewing is helpful. Where is somebody in the wanting to do something about their weight? Because if they don't want to do something about their weight, please don't tell them to do something about their weight because they're not in a space to do it. And ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, is very, very useful when food has been a survival tool. There you go. Have we got room for questions, Pauline? I'm finished. <laughs> no, we've, we've certainly got room. I've got one question already, and I'd encourage people to uh, send him some more. Um, Lana asks, with your clients, do you look at and involve their whānau, especially in South Auckland, with the change in support for weight loss? Unfortunately, because I'm now the reason I stepped out of the DHB was to provide support uh, for people who've had weight loss surgery. I'm not ex or I'm not really as accessible to those kind of clients currently. Um, I have in the past, absolutely, in programs that I have worked in. Um, and it is my real hope that I can actually make enough noise so that the government can see that it's really not just about stepping away from the food and it really is about Fano support, connection, belonging all of that stuff so absolutely just i'm just not able to be doing it as much as i would like so it, I'm, I'm just i'm just um thinking about that myself now kate so in building that therapeutic relationship that you're talking about if, if other people want to do the right thing and um it might be more appropriate to involve the final how, how does that actually happen do you think um that is actually how we ask what what would what would clients like you know, we make this a huge assumption that we know, and this is what you have to do. Actually, if we could be a little bit vulnerable, how can I help you? What can I do to help you improve this? Does this mean Fano? Does this mean how we're going to do it? It's not prescriptive. A therapeutic no. relationship is not prescriptive. And actually asking people, you'd be surprised about what people will tell you. And it makes you much more accessible emotionally, I'm sure. Um, Bronwyn asks, oh, she's, she says, no question, but I'm so glad that someone is actually researching this and is so knowledgeable about it. Thank you. And thank you for your work. Thank you. And then there is a question from Tonya. Uh, she says, is restrictive eating disorders closely linked with the psychology of comfort eating? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So 
if we understand the uh, the continuum, uh, anyone who is actually been on a diet probably has some disordered eating. Disordered eating and thought processes associated with disordered eating can go all the way from non-vomiting binge eating all the way down to anorexia. And many patients have slid up and down that continuum at various parts in their life. So yeah, uh, and a lot of what we're doing, when we talk about serious restrictive eating, all you've got to do is not eat the food. Again, we are aiding and abetting eating disorders. So when a fat person comes in with anorexia, oh, well, they can't be anorexic because they're fat. Actually, they have probably starved themselves so many times, their basal metabolic rate is so low that they're actually sitting with anorexia and they've actually got really low vitamins, a whole lot of their, um, their, their, their stores are completely depleted. But we mm -hmm. as healthcare professionals assume, well, they're fat, they can't actually be that. And they mm -hmm. actually are fat. Kate, can you please repeat the last concept of acceptance and commitment? Um, acceptance and commitment therapy is uh, essentially what's known as the third wave of CBT. Uh, and the difference with acceptance and commitment therapy to CBT is CBT is we use a lot of distractions. So if I'm an alcoholic and I'm trying to deal with my addiction, I will distract and go for a walk or I might distract and have something to eat. But if food is your addiction, if food is your survival, distracting is not useful. So we need to label, own, and actually deal with emotions. Learning to sit with emotion without using food to self-soothe is the root of how I work with acceptance and commitment therapy. Yeah. I'm just going to read something out to you, Kate. Oh my God, you have stripped me naked. Oh, I'm sorry. Bariatric surgery and all. How do we fix this for our patients? And then someone else, and then someone else says, "Is there anyone like you in all DHBs or primary care?" Unfortunately, I had to step away from my DHB role because I using acceptance and commitment therapy is very values based, and so when you recognise what your values are, um, that's where a lot of your conflict is. So when you have conflict, you will distract with food, sex, alcohol, whatever. So when I was working for the DHB and I was doing a whole lot of lobbying and, you know, people used to roll their eyes and go, oh, she goes about her fat people again. Um, I realized what I had was a values, com uh, a values conflict and I needed to do something about it. And I talked to managers, I talked to the CEO, I talked to my director of nursing practice. It was, it's too big a wieldy tool. So I realized I had to step out and actually set up something and just do it myself. So that's actually mm -hmm. why I sit here doing what I'm doing. And Should very stupidly for my sins, I'm about to start my PhD. Yeah, good. Mm. <laughs> do you do any lectures, <clears throat> any lecturing for nurses and, and doctors? Uh, no, I haven't been invited to. Oh, I'm surprised. Yeah. Okay, well, um, there are no more questions, Kate. That's been so, so uh, valuable, I'm sure. I know, because I've seen you in a real um, audience and you've had sort of standing ovations with clapping and everything. So <laughs> um, I I'm feel very confident that what you've given us today is very, very useful. Thank you so much. And with no more questions, I'll, I'll thank everybody for attending and close the meeting. Got it. Okay, see ya. <laughs>